All right, everyone, welcome along back to the channel today. And I've got a brand new video for you, and it's quite an interesting one. Now, I wanted to talk beforehand to just give you a little bit of context of what this video is about. Obviously, it's regarding the thylacine, but a few years ago, a university in Australia, which was called the James Cook University, set out on an expedition to try and find the thylacine in mainland Australia, specifically the Cape York Peninsula, all the way up the top. This was obviously quite an exciting thing in the thylacine community, like rumbles going about, like could there be thylacine on mainland Australia hidden away in the Cape York Peninsula? And that got me interested, so I contacted the scientist, one of the scientists involved in this search for the thylacine up in that area. His name is Professor Bill Lawrence. He's an exceptional scientist, one of the most cited scientists on the entire planet. He's very, very reliable, very, very good at what he does. And I've managed to get him on the channel today to talk about the expedition to the Cape York Peninsula in search of the thylacine, how it came about, what happened, was there anything interesting? in regards to the thylacine. So hopefully you enjoy this 15 minute chat with the man himself. Um, he's a really good guy. Make sure to smash a like on this video as well and drop a comment. Tell me what you think about what he says in the comment section down below. Enjoy. Um, when I originally got in contact with you, it was about the the, the, the search into far north Queensland, um, which was, was it 2017? Uh, that sounds about right, yeah. I, I suppose um, in the thylacine community, a lot of people heard about this and quite excited, um, but I, I suppose people never really heard an outcome. So. Should we start back mm -hmm. at the right at the start? How did this happen? How did it come about? What what happened there? Um, if I remember the details right, um, I was doing a radio interview on the environment with the local person here, and uh, he started telling me the story about uh, the sightings of a thylacine, and it turned out that I've got my own little wild thylacines just about to join us here. <laughs> um, so he had heard this, uh, you know, ostensibly credible sounding uh, account from a national parks ranger who, who claimed that he'd seen a thylacine in the early 1980s, I think it was, a long time ago. Yeah. But it was a really detailed account. And it was by someone that you would think would kind of know what they were doing. And then that uh, radio broadcast was heard by another, well, it was heard by a lot of people, but another person came forward and had also seen thylacines in the 1980s, or ostensibly seen uh, you know, a, a group of thylacines in the 1980s. So it sort of, you know, it was, interesting to hear these accounts, um, credible observers, detailed uh, descriptions of what these animals were supposed to look like. Um, knowing that the odds were always long, you know, that it was always going to be remote, that there was going to be a possibility of finding finding uh, thylacines um, up on the Cape York Peninsula, which is where we were, we were working. And so that sort of triggered it. And then I had a colleague that was working on it. And we decided to use camera traps, which are a good method. And people are using these camera traps now and are finding uh, James, as you probably know, that they're just discovering all kinds of things. You know, jaguars coming into the backyard. They didn't even know that before, you know, type of thing. And and uh, it's, so that was our that was our, the idea behind it. The other thing was, is that there's a there's a number of mammal species and other wildlife species that are declining right now uh, on the Cape York Peninsula region in northern Australia generally. And we were really interested to try to get up there and to have a look at some of these, some of the, in some of these poorly explored areas and try to see what we could find of these rare species. So, so how remote is far north Queensland, the Cape York Peninsula? How remote is that? Well, you can get to Cairns fairly easily, which is where I live. Yeah. After that, you know, you're going to need to get into a four wheel drive vehicle uh, and you're, or you can fly up to some of the smaller communities, but uh, you know, you'd probably be four wheel driving up there. That's what we did. We used a helicopter as well. And, uh, you know, it's rough roads, rough terrain in, in a lot of places. Many places are not roaded at all or, or really rough roads. Um, and then the other thing is that when the wet season uh, hits, a lot of those roads just turn into this muddy morass, you know, and you really can't get in and out of there at all. So uh, it's fairly remote. So yeah. how big was the scale of this operation then? What? So how many cameras did you have? Were there, were there like boots on the ground? What sort of scale are we talking about? Pretty big operation, field campaign. My colleague, Dr. Sandra Abel, really coordinated a lot of this. One of the things that she did is she brought in Aboriginal uh, rangers, uh, park rangers, and who were involved, very involved in this, which mm. is a fantastic thing. Mm. And we were also able then to get permission to work on some uh, native lands, indigenous lands, as part of this survey. And it involved um, 
Well, I know myself, I contributed about a hundred camera traps to the, to the campaign. And then there were some others that were used as well. At the end of the day, we got about a, just to give you a sense of how big and how, how long we, we ended up with about a hundred thousand photographs of wildlife. Yeah. Um, had to be looked at and identified and all that, but that gives you an idea of the scale. I suppose that's fantastic just in general for like um, the research in wildlife. Like, was there anything that came up there that was quite exciting? Well, I mean, uh, we're still, uh, my colleague is still in charge of those data and we really do need to get those published. I think the, the, the headline result, which is we did not find a thylacine, you know, of course is something that we released immediately, yeah. but there's other uh, information there. I mean, you know, the other thing that we collated, uh, James, was um, observations or, you know, anecdotal observations from people, not just those two people that I mentioned, but all kinds of people. And we ended up with dozens and dozens, scores of uh, observations and people claiming, uh, in some cases, pretty convincing sounding claims that they had seen thylacines. I mean, it could have been in Western Australia, it could have been in Tasmania, it could have been in the Northern Territory. They were all over the place. Hmm. And most of those, I would say, I, I could probably reject just given the fact that the, the observations were made by inexperienced observers. And that's a really common pattern as yeah. you get inexperienced people who tend to think they see things that an experienced, more experienced field biologist would, would not necessarily think. You know, yeah. that, that's a common pattern. Yeah. Anyway, so it was a, oh, so we got lots of interesting things that were uh, and photos sent to us. You know, I mean, perhaps the weirdest thing. Uh, James was, I got a photo of an animal that was, it kind of looked like a dingo, but its head was completely jet black. And I've never seen, it was just bizarre. And uh, I couldn't imagine anything. We, other things that we saw photos of, we said, oh, that's a tree kangaroo. Oh, that's a feral pig. You know, we could, <laughs> we could kind of work out what they were, but this we couldn't. And we finally ended up concluding that it must have been a dingo that stuck its head inside of like a dead animal you know, yeah. and got it all bloody and everything. Ugh. And then that all just, yeah, Gnarly. Anyway, <laughs> it was a weird looking thing. I'll tell you what I, can, really... I can imagine. Yeah. The other thing I should mention is I did get a crystal clear description. I mean, this gives you a sense of some of the stuff we were dealing with. I got an absolutely crystal clear descri description of a thylacine that a lady had seen and she was sure it was a thylacine and she saw it in the, she lived in the outskirts of Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. And yeah, exactly right. Hey, that's a new one. Yeah, I've I've that's never heard of that. Yeah. Oh no no, that was like okay, right? You know, it, st it sort of sounded good the first couple sentences, and then you realized what was going on there. Okay. So that, <laughs> but that's kind of emblematic of some of the things that we got because yeah. almost in all, most cases, people were sincere, and they were very often really convinced of what they'd seen. Yeah. Um, and I don't know what they're seeing out there, but I'm I'm pretty darn sure they're not thousands just on that what you mentioned there what they are seeing i asked this question to a um uh, a dingo specialist in melbourne um could it be the case of brindle dingoes um people are seeing those and they just see a striped dog looking animal and think that that must be the tasmanian tiger it's plausible that's very plausible i mean the, it's the stripes that tend to be the real you know key thing People will describe seeing an animal and sort of a dog-like animal and medium size type, you know, medium large size. Uh, but it's the stripes that yeah. they very often, yeah, it's those stripes on the flank and the hips and and um, and they're so distinctive in the you know in the live animal. But I don't know. What Can I get your thoughts on the thylacine? Do you do you think? I mean, it, it declared extinct in 1986. Do you think it, it it that was that was it? Or do you think like 1936 when the last one was seen, that was it? What's your thoughts on that? Well, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, I think most people have tra traditionally thought that that was the last one that died in the, in the I think it was the Hobart Tasmania Zoo. <laughs> um, and But then there have been these other sort of anecdotal observations. I would say this, if it didn't, if that wasn't the last one, it was pretty darn close to it, I think, because right. there just hasn't been any subsequent. I mean, the thing is this, uh, you know, James, if these things were alive, they just, you know, roadkill from vehicles, um, hit by, you know, shot by hunters. I mean, there's just so many different, you know, just died. And, and it's very difficult for a sizable animal not to have some kind of skeleton or fur or something picked up. And in this era of age of DNA, 
you know, it's really not that difficult to get things identified. So, so there was there was nothing found in the expedition that would like point towards maybe that is a thylacine. Maybe like there's a kill or there's just some sort of evidence. Was there just nothing at all? If if one's willing to kind of like look at you know look at the evidence in a particular way, I mean, I've hung out with some of my old buddies are, are what you might call crypto biologists and i have to say they'll look up they take a they draw a pretty long bow sometimes yeah. you know and they look at things in there and they convince themselves and, and so i think i'm just i like to think i'm just a credible mainstream scientist and i sort of use the normals the norms that we that we apply so given all that um i haven't we have not seen anything that would provide convincing evidence at all of thylacines being present on the cape york peninsula in the places where we worked yeah, uh, and which included some of the real, re- some of the more remote areas. Certainly not all the Cape York Peninsula by any means. And you know, there's been some other research subsequently, some modeling work which has suggested that the thylacine could have per- survived longer. And that study was done by some very good people. So you know, I'm not sure what to say other than um, uh, we can prove something's alive. We just can't. It's much harder to prove it's extinct. Yeah, as you know. Yeah, yeah. I can imagine. Yeah. So it, I mean. If the thylacine was still alive, there is like an animal or animals around still today. Would you have any idea of where that would be? Would that be Tasmania, mainland, or even uh, New Guinea? I, I think your your best bet would be looking in places that have not been well studied, and are not well populated. And and, and so yeah, I think places like Cape York and some of the Northern Territory areas, and yes, and New Guinea as well, would be good places to, uh, to look um and tasmania yeah of course tasmania um there's been so much work done i mean so many people have been looking in tasmania um there's one interesting observation uh, you might have seen this but a fellow had some very blurry film footage of uh, of an animal uh and he'd been spending a lot of time in tasmania looking for it and he got a uh so i saw the i saw the film footage and and he he collected a um a fecal sample from the animal and that got DNA tested. And anyway, I saw the animal and when I, I grew up in North America and uh, I raised a fo- pet fox, a red fox as a, as a youngster. When I saw that footage, I just said, that's got to be a fox, you know, yeah. and he, he and he took the DNA stuff in and it was a fox. Yeah. So, you know, I um, perhaps less likely in Tasmania, given that it's been quite thoroughly uh, explored. But I would say this, James. If this were a football game and if the game was against, you know, those who think that the thylacine is still alive, and there's many good people that really want to believe that, and those that don't don't really, I would have to say that, oh, well, let's let's just use a British football game. You know, the score's three nil for the people who don't think that the thylacine's alive. I would say something like that. But it's there's still 20 minutes to go and we haven't had injury time yet. So, you know, who knows? So let, let's say injury time does, does come about and uh, there's, there's, a, there's a winner there and the thylacine is discovered. What would happen? Uh, well, I have, I have to say, I, I have to think of this. I can't help myself but think of this as a scientist because if a scientist were to discover that, I mean, it would be like being on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine. You know, <laughs> you can imagine. I mean, it would be instant fame, you yeah. know. So, but beyond that, I mean, the thing is, is if we actually or someone actually found evidence of a thylacine, the first thing you'd have to do is to say, look, go to the government, go to national parks and say, look, what are we going to do? How are we going to manage it? You know, when, when is the news going to be released? What protective measures are going to be put in place so that because everybody and their dog is going to want to go racing up there, you know, to photograph or catch or see a thylacine. And you don't want that. No. So you've obviously got to maybe not even release exactly where it was found type of thing. Basically, you wouldn't, uh, you know, you'd be si- silence would be the best evidence of the thylacine being found. Um, kind of like right now, but I can tell you right now, we have not <laughs> definitely haven't seen it. <laughs> Oh, it's a shame, but it's it's good to hear it from um, a very credible source, you know, like, because um, I, I suppose a lot of speculation went into that from people, like, say, in the thylacine community, hearing about this, getting excited, and it's um, it's nice to hear, like, one way or another, like, no, we didn't we didn't get anything, we didn't get a hit, um, but I, I suppose from, from your perspective, I mean, you can't exactly rule out, like, extinction, I suppose, um, but what <laughs> what are the odds of this, like, cropping up is is there is there a potential for this to be a thing well there's always a potential and for something like this you know in a continent-sized country like australia and new guinea 
and uh, you, you know that type of thing. I mean, it, you never say never in this business. And there's been far too many so-called Lazarus species, you know, that we thought were extinct. Sometimes hundreds of years, sometimes millions of years. We thought, you know, the coelacanth, the famous mm -hmm. fish, uh, the Willemi pine, which was discovered near Sydney, last remnants of a family that was prevalent a couple hundred million years ago. Um, all kinds of species we could list. You know, we thought they were gone and they weren't. So, you know, uh, I think the smart money is to always hedge your bets a little bit and say, we, you know, uh, right now we can't say for sure, but I would say that the available evidence suggests to me that the thylacine sadly is extinct. Um, but I wouldn't say that there's no chance that it couldn't be around. And by the way, I would also give a bit of a shout out to the cryptobiologists and others that are out there searching some of these remote places for strange animals and creatures because they do find things yeah sometimes really yeah. interesting sometimes and so more power to them you yeah know? i mean even if it's not a thylacine something else might crop up that could be equally interesting you know um yeah that's a that's a really nice way of putting it i think that's a good way of ending it and i'll let you get on with the rest of your day um i just want to say a big thank you for coming on the channel and talking it's been an absolute pleasure um thank you for your time um is there anything you want to say uh to finish off no but just thanks for the invitation james and uh all good luck with you this is a nice channel you've got going i really appreciate it thank you very much all right cheers thank you